Okay, so kind of getting warmed up now into uh, hopefully now hitting our full stride in, in plasticity. I want to talk about plasticity in, in a 1D bar today. And we're, we're, uh, this is going to be a, a multi-series um, topic. So today we're just going to talk about uh, deformation measures. Um, but I want to use a 1D bar because it lets us look at plastic deformation um, just to illustrate some of the fundamental features of plasticity uh, before trying to complicate it uh, with all the requirements of uh, a tensor uh, stress and strain. And I know that you know if, if this was a different uh, a group of folks where you know everybody had a background in theoretical and applied mechanics or something like that, it probably wouldn't be a big deal. But uh, given that we have a, a pretty broad and diverse group of students with different backgrounds, some of some of whom don't have uh, much mechanics background, I don't want to complicate the fundamentals of this course with um, at least in, in the early phases with with all the. Uh, tensor language. We are going to get there. We are going to talk about that. But but I think a lot of the features that we really care about and that I really want you to understand, we can we can talk about with a 1D case. So so let's go ahead and and uh, just set up the problem. So uh, we want to begin by um, just defining uh, the 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 problem that we're looking at. So um, so we're going to define the bar in its reference and then in its current configuration or deformed configuration. So let's let's go ahead and we'll draw our boundary condition will be sort of a fixed wall here. So let's let's define our reference configuration. One of the features of a bar is that it doesn't have to have a constant cross section. So if we were to draw that, we can see that the cross section varies. We'll apply a load at the center. So that'll be uh, we'll label this our reference configuration. Um, we also might just say this is the undeformed state. Okay, so now what we want to ask is what happens when the load is applied um, at this boundary? Nothing's going to change, so oh, this would we'd like to kind of have a similar uh, uh, distance there to to show that it doesn't change. But maybe the the stretch of this thing, maybe it looks something like this. And so there's our our load. I should have labeled the load up here as well. Okay, and we're going to call this the current configuration. Sometimes we'll call that the deformed state. Now let's define a few features in here. So uh, as, as we've kind of done with with uh, uh, when we've talked about deformation measures in tensor tensor form, as we've done with a previous discussion of deformation measures, let's define a point, uh, and we call it capital P. Right. That's the that's the point. The same point in space under deformation, let's say, moves to this new location, and we'll label that as little lowercase p. Okay. So uh, as before, we are going to label this point with its location in the reference configuration. So if I were to draw a dashed line, uh, sort of down, I'm going to draw it clear through. Okay. So there's there's the location in space that that distance we're going to call capital X. Okay. And then we can also lo locate the, the location in the current configuration of its new location. And if I were, I'm still locating it from this wall, that, that's what we're going to call C in our, in our typical fashion. And that is going to obviously be a function of whatever the original point was and time. Okay. Furthermore, if I go ahead and project this up a little bit, we can define the displacement that point P moved from point at the from its location at X to its new location at C. We can label that displacement as this quantity inside there, which is just going to be U. Again, a function of X and T. Okay, so that's sort of the configuration that we're looking at uh, as we deform a bar. So I, I'll give you the one equation that we're going to use. So that's just for the displacement. So the displacement is defined as we've defined displacement before. U of x and t is going to be equal to c of x and t minus x, right? x is just a reference state. There's no uh, time dependence. Or... Uh, we could write it, let's say or, uh, we could write 
the current configuration as a function of the original co coordinate and the the uh, displacement. So it looks something like x plus u of x and t. Okay? Okay, so because x doesn't depend on time, we can write our velocities as follows. So we would say that the velocity of point x at any given time is going to be equal to the partial of its current configuration with respect to time, partial c, partial t. Um, which if, you, if we go ahead and substitute our displacement relation in, that looks like partial of x plus u of x and t, right? x has no time dependence, so the partial uh, with respect to time is zero there, and we're left with partial u, partial t. That would be our velocity. And, and we could say a similar thing if you wanted to about acceleration. So we would say that uh, uh, acceleration is, is just the partial uh, of the velocity with respect to time, which gives us partial squared c with respect to time, or we could write that in a similar way as partial squared u with respect to time. Okay, those are all equivalent statements. Okay, so having defined all the, the um, uh, quantities with respect to uh, position, current configuration, displacement, uh, etc., and velocity actually now, we can talk about three uh, typical measures of, of uh, deformation that we would use in this problem. Okay, the first is the stretch ratio, which you may recall that we've talked about. The second is just st strain. And the third, we didn't talk about in the tensor form, but it's, it's a commonly used quantity in plasticity and it's, it's the velocity gradient. So let's first uh, focus on the stretch ratio. So we, if you remember, we defined the stretch ratio lambda as the ratio uh, between the, the current separation of two close points uh, relative to the, the, uh, the separation of those points in the reference state. So it's effectively um, L, L plus delta L over L. So it's the new, the new distance divided by some old distance. But let's, let's define it formally. It's, it's the ratio of the current separation between two close points and their original separation distance. So if we were to draw a picture of that in the reference state, we would have one point, two points. We would call the, this point big, large, uh, big P, and then this is big Q. That distance between them we'll call delta X. And then under some deformation, those points separate, so this would be little p and little q, and that new distance is, call it delta c. So we then define the stretch ratio lambda uh, as, as lambda equals, the, the limit as delta x goes to zero, of delta c over delta x. So let's think about what that looks like. Um, delta c is going to be c so let's 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 go back and define this let's say remember p is at the location x and then q must be at the location x plus delta x so if you want to know the distance here we have uh, this location q which is given by c evaluated at x pl plus delta x and that still could be a function of time uh, minus C evaluated at x, again, as a function of time, divided by delta x. Don't forget that this is inside a limit. So hopefully you recognize that a quantity as just a der simple derivative term. So we would write this as the partial of C with respect to x. And of course, that is a function of x and t. Okay? Hopefully you recognize that del C del X term uh, as, as something very similar to the deformation gradient tensor that we talked about in its uh, full tensor glory. This is sort of the uh, kind of an equivalent statement in, in the 1D case. We can also write the stretch tensor, or the, sorry, the stretch rather, the stretch ratio in terms of displacement. So in, we, in terms of displacement, we can write that lambda is equal to, and we just use the same definition, partial 
I'm gonna pull out the C, but partial, partial with respect to X of C of X and T. And then if we uh, go ahead and, and just plug in our, our uh, how displacement relates to our current configuration, we have partial, that's a partial, with respect to X of now X plus U of X and T, okay? What's the partial of X with respect to X? Well, that's just one. And then this next quantity becomes the partial of U with respect to X, okay? So that's the relationship uh, between um, the stretch ratio and, and either our current configuration or our, our displacement quantity. Uh, and just be aware that, uh, remember that U is dependent on X and T and so is its derivative, okay? Okay, now, so that's one measure of deformation. Now let's move on to talk about strain. So uh, I'll just begin by saying that strain is gonna be defined in the normal way. Uh, we're gonna we're, we're gonna use we're gonna begin with delta L over L like, like you uh, probably feel comfortable with. So what that means in the in, in the terms that we've already defined is that the strain is going to be equal to again we have a limit. It's the limit again as delta x goes to zero, but now it's going to be of delta c minus delta x. Right, so this is the distance of the, the the deformed state. This is the distance in the new state. So the subtraction is delta L, and then the original distance was delta X. Okay. Um, so what we can do is we can go ahead and and write this out, but I want to I want to substitute in uh, for this quantity delta C. So delta C. Uh, looks like C evaluated at X plus Delta X. That's of course a function of temp, uh, time as well, minus C evaluated at X, right? That's, that's Delta C. And then we have minus uh, Delta X over Delta X. Still inside of our limit. I'm gonna write that just so we don't lose sight of it. Okay, what I wanna do now is, is substitute in for our displacements. So if I substitute for our displacements into these quantities, we end up with that, I'm gonna write my limit still, delta x goes to zero. So this quantity, C of x plus delta x uh, and T, that quantity, I'm gonna now use brackets because we have a sort of a subtraction term here. That looks like x plus uh, delta x plus u of x plus delta x t, right? So there's that c of x plus delta x term minus, and then this, this quantity here looks like x plus u of x and t. Okay, so that, that's what that large term was in brackets. And then I have a minus delta x. So, and then this whole thing is over delta x. Okay, so let me let me now uh, just do some simplification algebraically. So we still have our limit is delta x goes to zero. And now we have on the top u of x plus delta x t minus u of x and t. So this term go, is, we've taken care of and this term we've taken care of. This is a x here, and this is a minus x there, so that gives us zero. There's a plus delta x here and a minus delta x here, so that gives us zero. So that is the, the numerator, and our denominator then looks like delta x. Now, now it's in a form that hopefully looks familiar to you. Namely, it looks like a derivative. So we would write this then as the partial u with respect to x 
reminding you again, this is a function of x and t. Okay, so that's that's how we would define the strain. Uh, hopefully now you can kind of see if I just scroll up a little bit, I can relate the strain to the stretch ratio. So obviously I just found out this was the partial u with respect to x, and the partial u with respect to x is given in terms of uh, is related to rather our our stretch ratio. We can relate uh, strain to stretch in the following way. We can say, just substituting it directly into the equation above, we can write that lambda, which I'll again remind you is a function of x and t, is equal to 1 plus the strain, again a function of x and t, just like we defined before. Or we could write it in, a, in, in the other way and solve it for strain and say that the strain uh, is going to be equal to lambda x and t minus 1. Okay. In addition to defining strain in that in that normal way, which is which is uh, really an engineering strain, right? We're using the original length as as our reference. Uh, we can also define uh, what you might have called a logarithmic strain or the true strain, which is basically the the change in in length uh, divided by the current length. Okay, so let's let's see what that looks like. So to think about what this means, we actually go ahead and consider a, an increment of strain. So we'll call it d uh, uh, epsilon. So this is not total strain, this is a strain increment. And we want it to know what that strain increment is relative to the current length. And that's going to look like the, the, um, this differential length change divided by whatever the length is, okay? So this is the, the sort of the fundamental way we would define that. This is in contrast to um, using the L is no longer what it was and what the length was in the reference configuration. It's what the length is at this very at the moment in the current configuration. So what we would do is integrate this equation. Um, and integrating it, we can write that there's a, we're going to integrate from zero to epsilon L d epsilon L. So this is our logarithmic strain uh, is going to be equal to uh, we'll integrate the other side. When the logarithmic strain is is uh, zero, then our our solution gives us we're at l naught. Nothing has changed, and then we have a current uh, length l when this um, at the logarithmic strain, and then this becomes I want to I'm going to call it dl star. I'm only using stars uh, to be formally correct so that I don't use my my. Uh, uh, my variables of integration uh, incorrectly. Okay, so if, if we solve that equation, what this ends up looking like is that the logarithmic strain looks like the natural log of L over L naught. You know what the what L over L naught looks like. That's that's the current length divided by the original length, which is the stretch ratio. So it's really the natural log of the stretch ratio. Uh, which we could also relate to the the strain, the the engineering strain, as just one plus epsilon. Okay, so we have a way to sort of navigate between all of these these different features, uh, these different not features rather. Uh, we have a way to navigate um, between each of these different measures. The final measure that we want to talk about is the the velocity gradient. And we define the velocity gradient just, just like it sounds. It's the, the gradient of the velocity. So we define it usually with the, the quantity L, capital L. It's going to be equal to the partial of the velocity um, with respect to the current configuration. And remember that this is still a function of, of x and t. So as before, we, we want to be able to relate this quantity uh, to our other deformation measures. So let's let's go ahead and I want to I want to point out that uh, we define the velocity gradient as the velocity with respect to the change in the current, not in the reference uh, configuration. So uh, if we were to write this out, so let's just say let's go ahead and relate it to the other deformation measures. We just to 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 relate it to the stretch ratio, we just need to expand it out. So we say L is equal to uh, the partial with respect to C um, of the quantity V 
of x and t, right? I'm just expanding out what I what I wrote up there. And if I I have to use the chain rule to get to this. So this looks like the uh, partial of v uh, with respect to x times the partial of x with respect to c, right? Because v by itself is not a function of the current configuration. It's a function of the the, the reference configuration, okay? So you know what this term looks like. Uh, we define the stretch ratio as, as dc dx. So this is really one over that stretch ratio. So this is one over lambda. And then, uh, so, so we can go ahead and write this as one over lambda times the partial of v with respect to x. And now let's go ahead and, and uh, expand that out. So we say that the partial of v with respect to x, and I'm just going to use the definition of v, is the partial with respect to x of partial c partial t. Right? That's how we define it. I can take my partial derivatives in any order I want. So I can bring out the partial with respect to t and say that's partial with respect to t of the quantity partial c partial x. Again, you know this quantity, that's lambda. So partial t of lambda is just lambda dot. So we could write then that L is going to be equal to lambda dot over lambda. And now it's a pretty easy stretch to write uh, to write L, the velocity gradient, in terms of strain. We can just do our direct substitution uh, from the equations we had before. Uh, right, lambda dot is going to be partial with respect to t of lambda. Lambda was one plus epsilon divided by lambda, which is one plus epsilon. Okay, partial of one with respect to t is zero. A uh, partial of epsilon with respect to t is just epsilon dot. So this looks like epsilon dot over 1 plus epsilon. Okay, so that's that's how all of those uh, deformation measures are related. We're going to go ahead and use those as we as we now um, define uh, how plasticity and how plastic uh, deformation is going to evolve uh, in this 1D bar.